Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Pascal Goutron. He is a senior scientist over at Technicolor, and uh, he's currently embedded in a uh, moving picture company at VFX Film Studio. Uh, and uh, back in 2006, he graduated from ERISA University of Ren 1 with uh, his PhD focusing on GPU-based radiance caching. So without any further ado, Pascal. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. So <clears throat> thank you all for, uh, for coming. And today we're going to talk about uh, some uh, research work we've been doing at Technical Research regarding the um, streaming and high quality rendering of massive environments. So first, a few words on uh, technical research and innovation. So this, um, this is a central resource for the technical group, which provides some innovation in all the different fields in which technical works. So this ranges from um, uh, home networking to video compression to VFX and so on. So, there's um, a few hundred researchers there and located in different sites, among which uh, Palo Alto, so very close to here, and the main, um, the main site, which is uh, in Rennes in France. So as I said before, our focus is the, the rendering of those massive environments on various uh, devices, so ranging from high quality workstation to mobile phones. And if we look at the image here, we can extract a few challenges out of that. Typically, we need to be able to render some highly detailed terrains and to populate those terrains with some complex geometry reflecting what is actually on the terrain. So we're, here we're talking about virtual cities, for example, or forests, things like that. When it comes to rendering this complex geometry, we need to optimize the rendering by accounting for all the um, occlusions that may appear in the, um, <clears throat> in, the, in the scene so that we can uh, optimize the rendering and spend some time on what is actually visible. And finally, the, um, an important part also to produce some compelling visual effects or compelling um, virtual worlds is the rendering of atmospherics, so of clouds, atmosphere, smoke, and so on. So this will give the structure of this talk in which I will provide some overviews of some recent techniques we've been developing regarding the streaming of terrains, the generation of procedural geometry to populate the terrains, some uh, occlusion uh, cutting technique, and a technique also for real-time streaming and rendering of um, massive volumetric environments. So let's start with the terrains, so something you must be well aware. But um, the idea is, of course, to be able to render these uh, large data sets of terrains and, of course, to avoid having to download everything on the, on the machine before rendering it. And we want also to get some interactivity while navigating this complex environment. So here we'll talk about the data structure we're using to represent those, um, <clears throat> those terrains. And we'll talk about the sampling of a planetary terrain, especially to avoid the, the distortions. Then we'll consider the adaptive rendering to preserve some real-time uh, performance without compromising too much quality. And we'll particularly focus on uh, the stitching between some patches of geometry with different resolutions. So first, regarding the data structure, here, since we are talking about some massive data sets, we want to avoid redundancies as much as possible to save network bandwidth and memory. So we are going to use a multi-resolution representation in which, for example, if we have the, the terrain here, we can represent it by a simple block with very coarse resolution, like, for example, uh, 64 square. And then when we want to represent further details, then this block can be split into, uh, into smaller blocks, each with the same resolution, and so on and so on, until we get to the final resolution of, uh, of the terrain everywhere. And then we can use this hierarchy at random time 
to be able to focus the, the rendering the, and the, the fetching of data in the parts that are actually important for, um, for the current viewpoint. So we end up with uh, a partial tree of, um, of the entire database representing what is needed for the current, uh, the current viewpoint. What, what we can see here is that during the navigation, we would have to collapse some, uh, some nodes of, uh, of this tree, that is when we are getting away from detailed zone, and then expand some other zones if we need some more detail. But this would uh, require creating, destroying some, uh, some nodes all the time, and this um, can lead to uh, memory fragmentation and to some unnecessary um, unnecessary computations to maintain the tree. So while this is needed, we'll try to amortize this cost of creating and destroying some nodes by introducing some, uh, some levels of detail within each block. So within a given level of, um, <clears throat> of the tree, we'll have so a block, so, um, which is illustrated on the left. And at the very beginning, we'll only start with a few samples within this block so that we can render the terrain of the block with a very coarse resolution. And then when we need some more data, because the um, viewer is getting a bit closer to, uh, to the block, for example, then we'll transfer only the additional data we need. That is, we will avoid bringing back those, um, those dark spots. And then if we want to raise again the, the level of detail, then we'll only download the data we need and combine everything on the client side so that we avoid sending some redundant data. So now we have a representation of our terrain, well, on, of our flat terrain, but when it comes to planetary terrains, then we need a way of representing the ellipsoid of the, um, of the planet using um, a planar parameterization. So what is done very, uh, very commonly is to use cylindrical projection. You can see uh, at the top. And, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but there are some, um, some stretching of the, of the samples because the cylindrical mapping introduces um, a discontinuity at, this, uh, at the poles. And there are some, some sampling problems around the poles. So we want to avoid this problem. And to do this, we, uh, we take a simple cube map idea. That is, instead of wrapping the planet with a simple cylinder, we wrap it with a cube. And each face of the cube will be, will be used to project the samples onto the ellipsoid. So what we can see here very clearly that the problem at the poles will tend to disappear. But there will be some, um, also some stretching, especially in the corners of, the, um, of those uh, projection planes. So to avoid this, um, <clears throat> this sampling problem, let's have a look at what the um, sampling problem comes from. It comes from the fact that this projection plane would be sampled uniformly in the space of the plane. But what we would like to have is a uniform sampling of the surface of the planet to avoid these discontinuities and sampling problems. So instead of having this uh, uniform planar sampling, we'll use a uniform angular sampling so that we are getting much closer to, the, um, to a uniform sampling of the entire planet. And then each, uh, each face of, uh, of the cube is processed in the same way so that we can have an entire representation for, for our planet without discontinuities and without uh, sampling problems. So now the terrain is, uh, is modeled and completely stored in a database on the server side. We need to be able to bring it to the client side. So here we want to reduce as much as possible the work on the server side of, um, of the server because it needs to be able to to scale with many, uh, many different clients. So the server will only send this additional data under the form of chunks of, uh, chunks of a big file representing the, the Earth for the planet. 
And then all the assembly of the levels of detail and the generation of the geometry will be made on the, on the client side. So schematically, here we have uh, on the left the, um, the server side, which holds the entire database, and the client, which is made of two main parts at the top, so the adaptive rendering engine and the adaptive streaming. So the rendering engine provides some Im visual importance values of the, um, <clears throat> of the current view, that is depending on the current viewpoint, <coughs> the location of the viewpoints, elevation, and so on. We're able to deduce some visual importances of each block. And then from these importances, the adaptive streaming will hold a sorted list of importance requests and issue them to the server. Then the server replies with some data which are used to enrich the partial database hold on the, on the client side. And then this process continue, continues working during the navigation so that everything, uh, everything gets rendered efficiently. One problem which commonly arises with this kind of um, multi-resolution approach is the fact that between two neighboring patches, we may not have a one-to-one -one mapping between the different vertices of those patches. And the result is what you can see on the image, that is some cracks in the geometry. And this is something we definitely want to avoid. So to avoid that, we will create some strip masks that will perform an interface, will make an interface between some blocks of different geometry, of different resolutions. And this will, will allow us to get still this uh, this one-to-one -one mapping between vertices and avoid the cracks. Of course, there are some, um, some conditions in which this doesn't work, and this is a typical example. And to do this, the problem is that the size of, uh, of the blocks themselves cannot um, can provide any mapping with, uh, with this rough uh, coarse neighbor. So to avoid this, we simply put some constraints on the adaptive streaming engine so that it cannot refine one block if one of its neighbor is, um, is too coarse. And then everything gets, um, gets refined more or less at the same pace so that we, uh, we avoid this kind of problem. And uh, this is a small video of what we obtain. So, well, please excuse us for the poor quality of, uh, of the geometry and, uh, and photometry of the model. We don't have the same data as you guys have. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but here you can, uh, you can see the, um, the different blocks that get fetched depending on, uh, depending on the viewpoint, so that the blocks more or less always keep the same uh, projected size on the, um, on the image plane. So as a conclusion for this part, so this, uh, this technique allows us to um, render efficiently some uh, virtual terrains and particularly avoid the sampling, uh, the sampling issues. And this also maps very easily in, uh, on graphics hardware, which is good for real-time rendering. There's also some future work ongoing, especially to fix uh, popping artifacts that arise when we get some new uh, levels of detail. And um, also would like to uh, investigate the use of um, the geometry generation capabilities of uh, recent graphics hardware to fix those continuity issues in a more efficient way and perhaps to um, allow for very different levels of detail. So now we have a representation for our terrains, but those terrains must be populated and typically populated with cities or forests. And those represent some um, huge amount of data, especially if we consider some detailed, um, detailed geometries, as you can see on this image. So here, our approach would be to try to avoid as much as possible to send some explicit data, but instead to provide the client with just a set of rules to rebuild the environment itself so that we would save in bandwidth. So our requirements is something which allows us to reconstruct very quickly some, uh, some geometry and which can be tuned very easily by the author. And this technique, of course, must be uh, scalable on 
uh, various uh, kind of uh, devices with different capabilities. And we want to be able to provide some levels of detail. So this is what we, uh, we propose with what we call GPU-shaped grammars, which will perform the entire geometry generation in real time on the GPU. And we apply that to uh, vegetation and architectural models. So usually, this is a very common pipeline for uh, procedural generation, in which the user provides a set of, um, of rules parameters and a set of rules describing the construction of the, of the object. So for example, here it will say that there is um, a first floor, then a ledge, and then a number of floors. And this number of floors will be parameterized by the, <clears throat> by the rule parameters. We also provide some, the geometry of the terminals, that is the geometry of the elementary elements of, um, of the object. So for example, here that would be a window block or a door block, which will be uh, assembled to generate the final model. And the geometry generation engine runs on the CPU, generates a fully detailed model that can be stored, at least in RAM, before being rendered. So this works very well using uh, one or two buildings. But when it comes to huge environments, then we have the problems of the generation time and memory occupancy. So this is why we propose an interactive solution which avoids all this explicit storage and, uh, and generates geometry very quickly. So this is an overview of uh, our generation pipeline which is divided in three main parts. The first one being the rule compiler that will uh, transform all the construction rules into something interpretable by the GPU. Then the GPU will first take those rules and expand them to identify all the different terminal symbols. That is to build a structure representing which part of geometry will go where. So this structure is very, is very small and we use it to, uh, <clears throat> to fetch the geometry of the elements to generate the final, um, the final geometry, which is then directly streamed to the renderer without any storage. So first, the goal of the rule compiler is to transform this uh, grammar representation to something GPU interpretable. So to do that, we take as input a set of construction rules and a set of parameters. And these rules are typically described by a set of expressions that will, for example, test for some recursion level or put a given pattern on a, on a building facade. And they are also characterized by what we call a rule graph, which is how different rules call each other. And this rule graph expresses all the possible development of the grammar. So it, uh, it allows for, for loops so that uh, any uh, level of recursion iteration can be represented within this graph. So the expression gets compiled into, uh, into shader code directly, and the rule, map, the rule graph gets flattened into a rule map. And the parameters are also packed into, uh, into a parameter map, which is just a, a simple copy in, uh, in GPU memory. Then the goal of the rule expander is to interpret those expressions and, those, um, and, uh, and the rule map. So this is a, a generic interpreter that will run through the grammar and applies different rules and evaluates the expressions to generate the set of terminals. So this principle for rule expander is something very common in uh, procedural modeling. But usually what is done is that we start with a basic data structure that we refined more and more until we get the final model. This is, for example, taking an input footprint for a building. We'll start by extruding this footprint, then applying what is called a component split that will uh, separate the different um, faces of the, um, of the extruded footprint, and then apply some rules on each facade, and so on and so on, until we, uh, we end up with the entire set of terminals. 
So this works very well on the CPU, which, uh, which is very good at doing these kind of operations. But on uh, the GPUs, um, this G the GPUs are stream processors, which are very good at manipulating some very simple data. But they can manage lots of very simple data. So we try to leverage this architecture and reformulate the principle of expansion using the simplest geometry element we could, uh, we could use, that is just uh, 1D atoms, so just segments. So let's take just a small example so we'll, in which we'll start building a tree out of this, uh, this atom. So starting with this root, we can perform um, we can perform an extrusion that will generate so a face with its sides. And then on each of those uh, on each of those elements, we can apply also some rules. So for example, on the on the generated face, we will tag it as being a terminal. That is, we will replace it by a shape afterwards. And then we can continue the expansion. For example, by performing a branching, orienting some, uh, some branches, and then continuing extrusions, eventually uh, replacing the, some of uh, the elements by terminals, so that we can generate a structure that will start looking, looking like a tree. Then, once we have this structure, we, uh, <clears throat> we simply have to apply what we call a terminal evaluator that will take each of those uh, terminal symbols and replace it by um, the terminal geometry, that is, so by uh, geometry stored within GPU buffer. So to do this, we use um, ge uh, geometry generation um, of uh, latest graphics hardware, so namely the uh, tessellation engine, to, uh, to take just a terminal symbol represented by a single triangle and then generate many triangles out of that and shape them so that they follow the, the shape of the terminal. And then in the same rendering pass, the, um, this geometry is rendered just like any other object could be rendered. So in a, in a concrete case, let's consider the growth of uh, a bonsai here. So this is the full grammar which is used to represent the tree. So it, uh, it remains very small, which is good for uh, transmitting the data. And so starting with a root 1D atom, we can expand this into a set of terminals, which is illustrated here. Then each of those terminals can be replaced by the terminal shapes which are provided by the artist. And this provides the final geometry for our object, which can then be rendered to generate the final image. So this is a small example of the real-time uh, rendering and editing of, uh, of a tree model using our approach. So here we can edit the different per generation parameters to have the tree look exactly as, uh, as we would like to be. This works also for architectural models. So here you can see also a grammar mod to generate um, some, uh, some buildings. And in this case, instead of taking just a, one segment to, uh, to start the expansion, we'll start with a footprint. So the footprint will be divided into segments, which can then be processed in parallel by the rule expander, which will generate this, um, this set of terminal symbols. Then we can take a number of artist provided terminal shapes to generate the final model, which can then be rendered. So this technique allows us to generate any kind of uh, procedurally uh, generated uh, content. However, we can see that in a scene like that, we'd be dealing with thousands of buildings. And then in, in this typical scene, we're already talking about billions of triangles, which are definitely not renderable in real time on current graphics hardware. So if we get back at what we've been doing, we've been starting with very simple representation and making it 
more and more complex until we reach this level of complexity. So the idea is perhaps we could stop this expansion at different points to be able to generate some levels of details for free. And this is exactly what, uh, what we've been doing. That is, in red, we have the most detailed uh, level. So here we, in which we can have all the, all the geometry we want. And then for the buildings, which are a bit farther, the actual geometry of the terminals is represented by um, multi-view imposters, which are obtained by shooting each element from several views so that we, uh, we keep having some parallax effects. Then for buildings which get even a bit farther, we replace this multi-view by only one view because the parallax effect becomes negligible. And if it's even farther, then we'll try to avoid generating the terminal set because this would uh, remove a pass in the computation and avoids uh, the storage of this terminal set. So instead, we um, would just generate a simple extrusion matching the overall shape of the building and ray trace through the grammar for each pixel so that we can evaluate the grammar and get which pixel of the um, one view imposter is visible. So one important thing is that this is strictly equivalent to the, um, to the level of detail on the bottom left. So those two are completely equivalent visually, but in terms of structure, the one on the, le on the left requires the generation of the terminal set, but is very cheap to render, while the other one avoids the, the generation of the terminal set, but is more heavily fragment bound because we must perform some ray tracing. Then for buildings which are really in the distance, we simply use a basic wall texture, which is repeated the number of times we need for the, for the number of floors. And this is what, uh, what we have here, in which we, we can see on the left different levels of detail, which are generated and used during, uh, during navigation and, uh, and the wireframe result also. So an important thing is that we can select the level of detail for each terminal so that the part, a part of a building can be quite close while another part of the building can be far. So if the building is very big, we don't have to refine it completely. If we're very close to it, perhaps we would have to refine the first three floors, for example, and the rest would, can be kept coarse because they are too high. So especially for skyscrapers, for example, that's very useful. So here it's, it's, uh, it's very visible, this progressive refinement. We've also been um, doing some, um, some work on uh, a seamless transition between all those levels of details so that we avoid any uh, popping artifact. So this is uh, an example of uh, a very tall building with the different levels of detail here. So in conclusion, this technique allows us to um, generate some uh, very complex geometry out of a very small amount of data which can then be streamed in real time without any problem. And using our generation of levels of detail, then we can adapt to the capabilities of uh, different graphics hardware available. There's also some future work involved in there, especially regarding the snapping and occlusion, that is the interdependency of different buildings or trees, for example, to avoid a tree to grow within, um, within another one or within uh, the facade of a building. And this is uh, one of the limitations of our method because everything is performed in parallel. So it's very hard to introduce some interdependencies, but that's something we are currently working on. So now we have some terrains nicely populated with, uh, with buildings and everything, but we need to render them. And to render that, we, we would like to spend as much time as possible on the parts which are actually important and avoid the shading of less important parts. And if we look at how graphics hardware works, it's in, uh, in very complex scenes. For example, if we take this, um, this small element of, of the scene, this element is made of all those objects. And those objects, depending on the order in which they are sent to graphics hardware, it can be, for example, this one will be rendered, rendered first, and then another one may be rendered on top, so all the shading of the first one will be, will be lost on some, part, on some part of the image. 
and so on and so on. And even, for, for example, this object may be rendered so fully shaded before realizing that it's in fact hidden in behind all the others. So we're just throwing away 90% of our computations. And when we are talking about massive scenes, that means that for a single pixel, we can have many, many different fragments which have been shaded before just selecting one which would be in front. So that's where we, uh, we introduced this, um, this recalling algorithm to provide some uh, programmable calling uh, capabilities. So what, is, what has been present in graphics hardware for years is called early Z-culling. And <clears throat> this works by putting um, a fixed function stage within the graphics pipeline just, bef just before the fragment shader so that the rasterizer will generate all the fragments covered by, uh, by a primitive, like by a triangle. And then the early Z-culling will look at the values which are already stored in the depth buffer of graphics hardware to be able to discard the, the fragments if, they are, if we are sure that they will, be, um, they will not be uh, visible anyway. So this works very well at very high performance, but it also comes at a cost. That is, if we want to compute some, uh, some more complex things in the fragment shader, like for example, modifying the fragment depth, adding some um, alpha testing, for example, to make, uh, to make some vegetation, it's very often used, and, uh, <clears throat> and so on. So when your shader is becoming more complex, then the early calling is simply deactivated. So what we'd like to do is to be able to introduce some, um, some early calling within the fragment shader so that we could control exactly what's going on. So we'd like to, uh, to have like a calling shader embedded within the fragment. The only problem is that it requires both reading and writing within the depth buffer, which is definitely problematic because it can be implemented efficiently on graphics hardware. So instead, we simply use a buffer alternation technique that is instead of reading from, uh, from the Z buffer in the fragment shader, we will split our color buffer, our output, into two different buffers, holding both color and the depth. Then, to render a first object, we'll render it in the first buffer, while the second one will be used as a reference for, for doing some culling. And then, for the next one, we can just swap those buffers and get, um, get some relevant occlusion data from the previous one, and so on and so on. So this will allow us to propagate some information and to perform some culling. It will not be as efficient as the early Z culling because the Z buffer holds the entire data set of, uh, of depth, while the buffers only contain a part of the information. But it will still um, be used to, uh, to reduce the amount of shading we do. So practically, if we take a case in which we want to render one object here, we will try to find some, uh, some data in our depth reference. So for the first object, it's obvious everything passes. And then we swap these buffers. And then we can do the same thing and identify that some, uh, some of the fragments are actually overlapped by what is present in the first, uh, in the first buffer. So we can just kill those fragments before computing the, the costly shading. Oops, sorry. So this, um, this works, but the problem is that this alternation of buffers doesn't come for free either. So we definitely don't want to do that for each, um, for each object, because in this case, the buffer swapping would dominate the rendering cost. So instead, we, um, we try to batch the objects. And we are, we are doing these batches using depth grouped objects so that those um, <clears throat> the depths group will, uh, will tend to cover some wide areas in, on the screen. If you take, in, uh, for example, in this, uh, in this scene, if we take uh, a part of the, of the image, this is a few batches, depth sorted batches of objects. So those tend to span a large area on the, on the screen, so it's populating the buffers quite quickly. And in at least when scenes are well modeled, 
then objects with very similar depth tend not to be overlapping. So we reduce the overshading within, uh, within a given batch. And using, um, using this, we can implement a simple early Z curling in which we, we can see that here we will test the, um, the different um, the depth and discard if the object is occluded. So this does exactly what we've been talking about before. That is, we detect some uh, the occlusions and just stop the rendering at that point. But the problem is that when we have a third object we'd like to, to render, then we check in this buffer, but there's no information available. So we may completely shade this object and just resolve to post-shading elimination by the z-buffer. So we can see if we can do better than that using an optimized early z-culling in which we would start with exactly the same process. But here we have some fragments which have been generated by the rasterizer. We got some relevant um, depth information here. So instead of just throwing it away, throwing away those fragments, we can do some sustainable development of fragments and reuse them so that we, can, uh, we will copy the reference information here. So that when we render a third object, then we have some relevant data to, de to detect the occlusion. And this is um, one of the things we, we've, been, uh, we've been using and so you will see in red all the occlusions which are detected by, the, <clears throat> by our technique. And uh, here the, the fragment shader is, um, is deliberately complex to be sure that the early decaling doesn't work. And so in this case, we uh, gain some, uh, some rendering time. And we gain even more rendering time when the scene gets highly occluded. Like, for example, this uh, forest scene, the popping is just due to um, the different levels of detail. And here, there, there are some huge occlusions. And then we can divide by two, so rendering time. So this, um, this technique comes complementary to uh, the early Z calling technique. Because early Z, it's hardwired in graphics hardware. It works very well when the shading is simple enough. But when the shading gets more complicated, and uh, typically when, um, for example, doing some relief mapping or things like that, which modify the fragment depth, then this technique can help to, um, to simplify the computations. So the last part of uh, this talk will consider the rendering of uh, atmospherics. And still trying to um, look at some complex scenes involving some volumes. So we'll talk about the streaming of very large volumetric data and the, oops, sorry, and the efficient rendering of, um, of this data set. So if we have a look at a real image, not, uh, that's not a rendering, unfortunately. But there, in the real world, there are many, uh, many translucent objects. This is so a typical case so between the, the, the clouds, water, ice, snow, and uh, you could have yeah, smoke, dust, participating media. So all those translucent objects are everywhere. And we, if we take a closer look at some participating media, and let us have a look at what happens when uh, some light arrives in a, in a cloud or in ice or anything. Then the light will first be absorbed by the particles within the, um, within the cloud. That is, it will be converted into other sources, other um, energies such as heat. And then the light is also scattered. That is, it is re-emitted by the particles at possibly a different wavelength. So basically, this means just the translucence effect we can see in uh, all the transparent objects. So what we can see here is that if we want to render um, some participating media, we have to represent this inner structure. So there are many ways of representing this, uh, this structure. So it mainly depends on the application. So for example, for games, 
the particle representation is very often used because it allows also to make some um, some real-time simulation. In visual effects, very often it's more a voxel-based representation which is used, which is the 3D analog of, uh, of the pixels. And all those techniques have something in common, in that they explicitly represent all the inner structure of those volumes. And it means that even for uh, this simple scene covering a few kilometers square, then we're already talking about gigabytes of data, just because like one cloud is 128 megabytes. So there's definitely no way of storing that in graphics memory, at least in current graphics hardware, and not to render that. But what we've been doing in terrains can also be valid in volumes, so that we can also have a hierarchical decomposition of blocks for, for volumes, so that we can have um, a coarse block giving the overall uh, information about, about the cloud, and then this block can be split into, uh, into smaller blocks to generate some higher resolutions. And this is what, uh, what we have in a, <clears throat> in a more complex scene, in which we can see that well, the volumes are refined, so in many, many boxes, and uh, those boxes are fitting more, more and more tightly the, the volume. So in, in those participating media, what we have is just a representation of the, of the density of particles anywhere in uh, like in the atmosphere or in these clouds. And the overall appearance of the, all those clouds come from the interaction of the clouds with the light. So here we, um, <clears throat> we look at what happens exactly when we have a light ray coming through our scene here. So here we represent the, the transmittance function, which describes how the light is attenuated where, with respect to the distance. So at the beginning, the light is not attenuated at all because it's in vacuum. And then when it gets into, uh, into the cloud, then it starts dropping. Then this can be done in several situations in which, depending on the number of clouds, we would have a number of steps. And if we want to render those, um, those objects, those volumetric objects, then we want to to be able to represent this transmittance function, to be able to know where the shadows will be. And a very classical technique used in uh, visual effects is uh, what's called deep shadow maps, in which we'll represent those functions by generating explicitly some samples of the function so that we can fit as precisely as possible the shape of the function. So this technique works very well, and it can be very accurate. But the problem is that you can see, for example, on those different rays, if we want to have a similar accuracy, then we need to generate various number of, uh, of samples. Furthermore, we need to be able to determine where the, sam the samples are the most useful, which means that we need to generate many samples and then decimate them to select only the ones which, which are really useful. And this is something the GPU is neither very, very good at doing. It can be implemented, but it's uh, first quite hard to implement and uh, not always very efficient. There's another technique which, uh, can, uh, which can be used for real-time rendering of clouds, which is called transmittance function maps. And this technique replaces this explicit sampling of points by a projection into um, in Fourier space. So it will replace this, um, all these samples by uh, a projection of, um, <clears throat> so it will replace them by a set of coefficients representing the function. This can be seen as the analog of a bitmap in which we would have some, um, well, the pixels explicitly uh, represented by some values and the JPEG compression in which some blocks will be, the variation of uh, color within blocks will be represented by a set of coefficients and then reconstructed to display the image. And unless that, here we're not talking about image blocks, but we're talking about functions along light rays. So this allows us to generate some approximations of 
the, of the transmittance along those light rays. However, this uh, Fourier projection is based on the, um, the accumulation of oscillating functions. And those oscillating functions don't do that well with, the, um, with all the, um, the straight parts of the curve. And it will very likely introduce some oscillations in here. Also, what's, what we can see is that the fact that we represent the entire function that will represent a function on all this part, which, which is absolutely not useful because there's nothing in there to render. So we would like to concentrate our representation in only the part which are useful because otherwise the oscillations give this kind of effects. So a dimming with respect to the distance. So intuitively, what we would like to do is to uh, introduce a metric that will be stable when we are not within medium and then that will grow when when we are within the medium so that we can uh, we can represent our transmittance only in the useful parts as you can see on the right this can be done in the spirit of the deep shadow maps by just storing the intervals in which there are the mediums are present So, for example, in this uh, in this case, we can uh, we want to compute the amount of light reaching the point here. So we will first compute the distance between the point and the light source, and fetch the corresponding metric value. Then this value will be used to get the transmittance, which is then used to compute the amount of light reaching the point, and then deduce the amount of light reaching the viewer. So this seems to work well, but we still have this explicit sampling. So we, we've made a new technique, but we've got the same drawbacks that we, we need to compute this explicit list of samples, which we don't want to do. But if we see at the transmittance curve, what we've been doing before is just starting from deep shadow maps with an explicit list of samples and re replacing that by just a set of coefficients representing the curve. So why not doing that also with our, uh, our pseudometric here? So that we can generate an approximation of the metric that will warp our space so that the zones in which there are some, um, some actual participating media will get more, more representation power, we'd say. That is going from here to there so that we are much more closer to, uh, to the reference values. So when we want to compute all this, let's quickly see what, uh, what we're doing. We'll simply take the bounding boxes of all the volumes we want to render and render them from the point of view of the light source to generate our pseudometric function. Then we render our actual volumetric data and deduce the transmittance function along light rays using the pseudometric. Then, when we want to render the actual image, then render our, all our volumetric data from the point of view of the user. And for each shaded point, we can fetch the, the pseudometric value and deduce the transmittance. And this is different, so without using this uh, pseudometric and using it. So you can see that we are avoiding this unnatural deeming of, uh, of light with respect to the distance. We've also extended our approach to support environment lighting, in which lighting can come from any direction of uh, any direction around the cloud, and also to support multiple scattering, which is uh, highly present in uh, light smokes, for example, on clouds. And this is our um, test scene which comprises up to uh, 10 gigabytes of data, which is streamed also in real time. <clears throat> and this is a small example so of also animated media. So in this case, during the animation, the so resolution is kept quite low to be able to stream the, to stream the data in real time. And if the, um, if the resolution is small, it, sorry, if the animation is stopped, then everything gets, uh, gets refined.
And then all the volumes are, are refined depending on the viewpoint, just like we do uh, for the terrains. So this technique allows us to uh, represent, stream, and render some uh, large participating media. And still, this remains uh, adaptive regarding to the capabilities of uh, graphics hardware and the available memory also. So there's also some, um, some work we're currently working on, especially in um, adding some uh, filtering features so that we could support some kind of mid mapping on this um, pseudometric map to be able to get some smoother results. Would like also to introduce uh, some more efficient multiple scattering capabilities. So this concludes this talk, which we've been uh, looking at different aspects of uh, real-time rendering of uh, massive environments. And uh, you can find some uh, additional uh, information as well as papers, videos, and so on on, uh, on my website. And uh, also feel free to contact me via email. And uh, if you're coming to Seagraph, then uh, please come to my talk on, uh, next Thursday, and uh, we'll talk in details about the volumetric uh, rendering uh, system. So thank you for your attention. It's, uh, it's unfortunately, yeah. So um, the question is um, regarding the terrain rendering and um, how we determine which block is important. And, uh, so how we determine the visual importance of, uh, of each block. So um, unfortunately, it's a very, very coarse uh, approximation of uh, visual importance, mainly based on the, um, the size of the bounding box of the block and um, have the uh, maximum elevation within the block so that we can we try to uh, to refine data like if you've got some uh, some mountains on the horizon to be able to to get something on the horizon but um, unfortunately no uh, really uh, visual uh, yeah visual, full visual attention models or anything running there Well, it's in fact that's that's what we do. That is, we um, when we have this um, our, our block which is fully defined, then we can either render it fully, so using all the all the vertices we have, or we we have some uh, various geometries with the different possibilities on the edges, so that we we use one, one geometry or another. And so we are. We would be skipping some uh, some data. So this is more or less the same uh, the same thing, unless that um, if you have like one one thing doing like that and the other one there, perhaps you don't want even to to feel that, like making a cliff which is not there. So in this case, it allows us to uh, try to be as close as possible to the real model. Yeah. Who funds this work? What's their business? <laughs> so this is um, oh yeah the question is um, so who funds this work and the purpose of um, of all this so who funded it so it's a technical group <laughs> and uh, but yes there's business uh, business potential behind this the first one is um, some use in the visual effect. So, especially to provide some uh, real-time pre-visualization of complex assets, because um, right now the artists are very often uh, obliged to perform some very costly renders just to see what the scene looks like, and uh, so this costs a lot. <laughs> and this is uh, one of our main reasons for doing that. And uh, we've got also some uh, applications in uh, set-top boxes, 
in, uh, in Technicola. And um, in this case, since uh, recent set-top boxes come with, uh, with GPUs, then we can have many different applications on that. And uh, well, 3D games in general is something in which, uh, in which the group is also interested. So the question is in um, the robustness of uh, of rules. If um, if there are some uh, yes yeah, some holes or or things like that. In fact, when um, <clears throat> when we have all all our rules, then we um, we really run this uh, this rule graph. And for example, let us imagine um, a facade in which I want a, a hole right in the middle. I don't know to make a tunnel in the middle. Then I can simply run uh, run that and have a condition. So program a, a condition like if I'm on the third floor and a second window, then I don't want a window here. I want something else or a hole. So since we evaluate all these expressions in real time, then we'll be able to determine, OK, here I don't put anything. And so this will create a hole. What it will not create, of course, is like if we've got our building with a hole in it, it will not generate like a tunnel with the geometry inside and everything. It will just make literally a hole. But uh, the, um, the grammar itself has uh, no problem representing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.